بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولهما بعد. So today we're going to continue إن شاء الله تعالى in our lecture on the lives of the Sahaba and today we're going to do two Sahabi who are commonly confused together and who have very similar names and who have somewhat similar backgrounds and stories. And these two Sahaba are number one Saad ibn Mu'adh and number two Saad ibn Ubada. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh and Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. And the two of them are generally, a lot of times they're confused between each other. Uh, but inshallah ta'ala, after today's lecture, everybody should be clear who is who. So let's begin with Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh uh, was the leader of, and both of these are Ansar. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh was the leader of the Aus, and Sa'ad ibn Ubadah was the leader of the Khazraj. That's why they're confused, because they're both leaders of the Aus and the Khazraj. So Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, was the leader of the Aus tribe. Now, does anybody remember between the Aus and the Khazraj, which one was considered to be higher ranking? Who remembers? Anybody? Between the Aus and the Khazraj, which one was the higher ranking in terms of Jahili customs? The Aus was the higher ranking one. So Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad was the leader of the Aus tribe. And when Mus'ab ibn Umayr came to Medina after the first treaty of Aqaba, Mus'ab ibn Umayr began preaching uh, to the people of Medina. And Mus'ab ibn Umayr, of course, is a muhajir. We all know his story. Then he died in Uhud and whatnot. Uh, Mus'ab ibn Umayr, he was preaching in Medina and one of the earliest converts, in fact, the first person to ever convert from Medina was somebody by the name of As'ad ibn Zurara. As'ad ibn Zurara. As'ad ibn Zurara, by the way, he converted uh, when the Prophet was walking in Mina and he saw a group and he goes, who are you? They said, we are from uh, Medina, from Yathrib. So As'ad was in that group, the initial batch that the Prophet spoke with. And As'ad then converts to Islam. Mus'ab ibn Umayr comes and As'ad and Mus'ab, the both of them are then going in Medina and giving da'wah to the people uh, in Medina. By the way, As'ad uh, was... Um, uh, he passed away in the first year of the Hijrah. And so there's no story we're going to give about it. I'll just mention, As'ad ibn Zurara was the first convert of Medina. And he was the first person to die in Medina after the Hijrah of the Prophet So he was the first janazah ever prayed by the Prophet There are no janazahs in Mecca. He didn't pray janazah in Mecca because there was no political authority. So the first janazah that the Prophet ever prayed was for As'ad ibn Zurara. And the first person therefore buried in Baqi' from the Muslims was As'ad ibn Zurara. Now, we're not talking about As'ad. As'ad, his first cousin is Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. We're talking about his cousin. So Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad is his cousin from his mother's side. So they're not from the same sub-tribe, but his mother's from the same, uh, the, the two mothers are from the same tribe. So... As'ad and Sa'ad are first cousins. What happens? Mus'ab is preaching Islam. I know there's too many Az'ais and Sa'ad here. There's Mus'ab, there's As'ad, there's Sa'ad. Don't get confused. Mus'ab is the Meccan Muhajir. As'ad and Sa'ad are from Medina. So, As'ad and Mus'ab are giving da'wah to the people of Medina. And they go tribe to tribe. One day, the two of them go to the tribe of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. Okay, so they go to that area of Medina and they sit down and they start preaching to the people to convert to Islam. News reached Sa'ad that these two guys are in our camp, in our territory, in our neighborhood, and they're preaching Islam. So Sa'ad being the chieftain, Sa'ad being the leader, he became very angry. And he said, what right do they have to come to our land and to our neighborhood and try to convert people to their faith? Why are these foolish people trying to convert our impressionable young, misguide our women? And he then told his best friend, Usaid uh, ibn Hudayr, he told his best friend Usaid, look, I can't go, the guy's my cousin. He's my first cousin, I can't go and physically beat him up because that's going to be awkward. I want you to go and handle those two. Clear enough? You go and handle them and say, either get out or else we're going to beat you up or do worse. So, Usaid went with his spear and with a very menacing uh, you know, uh, gesture and whatnot, he said to them, why are you two here? If you value your lives, leave. And this is coming from the chieftain from Sa'ad. Mus'ab, as you know, was a very calm, gentle Sahabi. Mus'ab, uh, uh, the, the one who the Prophet sent to give da'wah to the people of Yathrib. Mus'ab said, very well, if you want us to leave, we'll leave. But let us speak to you first. At least listen to what we have to say. If you like it, good. If not, we'll leave. 
And again, this shows us the wisdom of Mus'ab. So uh, Usaid sat down and he listened to, uh, he said, this is a, you, you have done fair, fair enough. We're not going to lose anything. So he put, put his spear in the ground and he sat down. He said, okay, go ahead. What did you want me to hear? And Mus'ab gave him da'wah to Islam. And lo and behold, Usaid converts. Usaid converts to Islam on the spot. Then he said, how do I enter this new faith? And Mus'ab ibn Umay said, you have to do ghusl, come back to us, we'll teach you how to pray, and uh, you are now a Muslim. So this is what Usaid did. And then uh, when uh, Usaid stood up to leave, he said, I'm going to go back to a person and send him to you. If he converts, the whole tribe will convert. I'm going to go back and send a person. The next guy that comes here, if you manage to convert him, the whole tribe of the Banu Abd al-Ashhal, which is one of the tribes of the Ansar, are going to convert. So Usaid goes back, Sa'ad sees him come back after half an hour, 45 minutes, however long it was. Sa'ad sees him, comes back, and Sa'ad says, this is not the same man that has left us. And many times in the seerah we hear this phrase, that when somebody converts, you can see the change on his face. And if any of you have witnessed a conversion, I firmly believe this to be true, you see the Nur al-Iman, if you like, you see the spiritual change that comes from the person who embraces Islam. So Sa'ad says, this Usaid is not the same Usaid that left. Something has changed, but he doesn't know what. So Usaid comes back, Sa'ad says, what happened? So here, Usaid said something. We don't know. Did he not know the rules of Islam? Or was he using a type of tawriya, hidden message? We don't know. It appears what he said was not true. Or maybe it's a type of double meaning that we don't understand the story behind. But uh, Usaid says to Sa'ad, Oh, don't worry, I stopped them and they agreed to leave. However, on the way back, I heard that the tribe of Banu Haditha, that was a tribe that had problems with the tribe of Sa'ad, the tribe of Banu Haditha has sent some people to kill your cousin. Because they know he's your cousin and they want to get rid of him to get to you. At this, Sa'ad became worried. They're going to attack my cousin. Now the love comes out. They're going to attack my cousin. So he took his weapons and he rushed forth only to discover there is no attack. And Sa'ad understood the only reason that I would have been told this is so that I listened to these guys. Sa'ad understood that I've been tricked by my best friend. He told me something that didn't seem to be the case. And this made him even angrier now. Because when you're tricked, you're not happy. This made him even angrier. And he threatened the both of them that they had better leave his territory, his neighborhood, or else he would physically deal with them. And Mus'ab, in his gentle and charming manner, said the same thing, that look, we agree to leave, but what do you lose by sitting down and listening to us? Nothing to lose. You just be a gentleman, just listen to us, and then if you don't agree, fine, we will leave. So Sa'ad calmed down, and he listened to Mus'ab ibn Umayr. Mus'ab ibn Umayr recited the Quran, Surah Yusuf most likely, because that's what we know that he had memorized at the time. And Sa'ad ends up converting as well, subhanAllah. So in one day, you have two people that are mainstream in the Ansar, they end up converting. And he as well uh, performs ghusl, takes the shahada uh, and prays in front of them. And then he goes back to his people and he says, Oh my people, what do you think of me? amongst you. So they said, you are our leader. Anta Sayyiduna, you are our leader and we respect and admire and follow you. So then Sa'ad said, if that is the case, then I swear by Allah, I will not speak to any of you, man, woman or child, until you embrace Islam. It's emotional blackmail. I'm not going to do anything with any of you until you embrace Islam. And for the next few days, he continued to preach and talk about Islam and the message of Islam. And he invited Mus'ab over to preach to his people until finally his entire tribe converted to Islam, the Banu Abdul Ashal, which is one of the sub-tribes of the, of the Aus. And it is said, after Sa'ad converted, and they say nobody's conversion was more blessed than the conversion of Sa'ad. After Sa'ad's conversion, there was not a household in Yathrib, because this is still Yathrib, it's still not called Medina, this is pre hijrah There was not a household in Yathrib except that at least one person had embraced Islam because of the stature of Sa'ad. Sa'ad was the most respected, one of the most respected of the uh, Ansar. And 
uh, out of the people of Yathrib. And so his conversion generated the conversion of his entire sub-tribe, the Banu Abdul Ashal. And in every household in Yathrib, some people converted at the conversion of uh, Sa'ad. And Sa'ad then also participated in the second Treaty of Aqaba, because again, this is now between the first and the second treaty, Mus'ab was sent, right? Mus'ab was sent between the first and the second treaty of Aqaba. So this is taking place uh, before the second treaty of Aqaba. So then Sa'ad goes and he uh, uh, witnesses, he's one of those who attended the second treaty of Aqaba. And he participated in Badr, and Sa'ad was one of the main people who would be given the banner of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in many of the battles. Uh, and in the battle of Badr, uh, the banner that was held by the Ansar was held by Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. So Sa'ad was the one who is essentially put in charge. He's chosen by the Prophet to be representative or the leader of the Ansar. And in the Battle of Badr, one of the most iconic conversations, one of the most powerful conversations takes place between Sa'ad uh, Ibn Mu'adh and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that is when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam discovers that there is no caravan, rather it is the army of Abu Sufyan and it's a thousand strong, and it has 300 camels and horses, and, and, and. And he realizes they are not equipped to fight the army. So he then says to the Sahaba, what do you think we should do? And Abu Bakr stands up and says, go ahead, Ya Rasulullah, we're behind you. So the Prophet thanked him, made dua, said, okay, what do you guys think we should do? Same question. Umar stands up and says, Ya Rasulullah, we're going to follow you. Go ahead and do it. The Prophet thanked him for the third time. What do you think we should do? Al Miqdad ibn Amr stood up, another muhajir, another muhajir. And he gave a powerful answer, a very strong one. He thought maybe yes isn't good enough. I need something more than a yes, we're going to follow you. He says, Ya Rasulullah, if you go here, you go there, we're going to follow you through thick, through thin. So he gave a powerful answer. And the Prophet thanked him, made dua for him. For a fourth time, he said, What do you think we should do? People are confused. What's going on? How can you ask the same question four times? Then Sa'ad figured out. And Sa'ad stood up and he said, Perhaps you're intending us, Ya Rasulullah. Yani four times, what is the point? Perhaps you mean us, the Ansar. So then the Prophet said, Ajal, yes, I meant you. I want to know your response. Remember why? Because when the Ansar, including Sa'ad, had agreed at the second bay'ah of Aqaba, what was the condition of the second bay'ah of Aqaba? The condition was, we will fight you in defense. We will not fight you in offense. Okay? And Badr was not defensive. Badr was taking place, you know, it's two hours drive outside of Medina right now. If you go to Badr right now in the car, it'll take you two hours. That's not defensive. That's offensive. They're not attacking Medina. And the Ansar had not signed up for offensive warfare. That's the key point now that the Prophet wants to know, are you going to join or not? And this also shows us the, the sensitivities of the Prophet in fulfilling the contract. Like he knows what was promised. And so he wants to get it from them. Are you going to upgrade or not? Because I can't demand it of you. That's not what you signed up for. But you have to volunteer it. You have to yourself be willing to add that condition. Okay? And so when the Prophet said yes, I meant you. Then Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad spoke up on behalf of the Ansar, and that was where Sa'ad gave those powerful uh, uh, words, which are so beautiful in Arabic. Uh, and basically, essentially, he said, Ya Rasulullah, we have believed in you, we have followed you, and we hear and we obey. So, from the Haythu uh, Amarak Allah, go forth wherever Allah Azza wa has commanded you. For Wallahi, even if you take us into the ocean, we will come charging behind you. And if you do this, we will do that. And you will find us patient. And you will find us faithful. And you will find us hearing and obeying. And perhaps Allah will show you through us things that will make you happy. So this was Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. And when the Prophet ﷺ heard this, the books of Sirah mentioned, he was happy, beaming for joy. So Sa'ad brought so much joy to our Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ made dua for the Ansar. And because of this, of course, they decided to remain and fight against the, the, the people of Badr. And what happened, happened. And so Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh played a very, very crucial role on behalf of the Ansar from upgrading the status of the Ansar from only defense to also offense. And after this, there was no 
no need to ask because the Ansar all signed up. So Sa'ad represented the Ansar and Sa'ad radiallahu an then volunteered to upgrade and all of his people followed him. And Sa'ad also participated in the Battle of Uhud. And uh, one interesting thing that is mentioned about him, that when the Battle of Uhud finished, and as we know, there were 70 martyrs in Uhud, uh, the, the women of Medina, they began wailing over their dead. At this point in time, it was not haram. And each subsection or each neighborhood, the voices of the women were being raised up. There was a certain type of poetry, a certain wailing, a certain thing, a cadence that would take place in their speech that would be known. And one of the goals of wailing, by the way, in the days of Jahiliyyah, was to make sure that the memory of the dead is not forgotten. It's like to boast about, this is our guy who died. It's a type of boast that, just like in this country when a uh, one of the military dies, so the, the family is given a special gold star and there's, his name is inscribed and the 21 gun salute. And so there are things that are given, buried in a special graveyard, the, you know, the uh, Virginia, the Arlington Cemetery. So there's honor that's given to uh, the martyr in every single tradition. And our tradition is no different. Now, at this point in time, one of the honors that was given to the Jahili dead was singing or wailing a type of poetry or a type of, you know, a particular things that, that would be said. And obviously, the more powerful the poetry and the more women singing and the louder, it shows you how much they're proud of their dead, right? So the Prophet entered the city of Medina and every single place that they passed by, they could hear the voices of the women. And our Prophet ﷺ was sad and he said, but Hamza, has no one to cry over him. Means we don't have the women. You know, you guys, all of you have your women. My uncle died and there's nobody that can come together and probably don't have the women of the, uh, his family members that the, the likes of which you do. And Sa'ad heard this one phrase. And so Sa'ad went to the Banu Abd al-Ashar, which is his tribe. And even though they had suffered many casualties, he gathered all the women and he took them to the house of the Prophet ﷺ, and he made them sit outside and they all began to raise their voices composing poetry for Hamza. And this wallahi shows an amazing thing. They have to ignore their dead and they have to now you know, concentrate on Hamza because of the love for the Prophet ﷺ. So it was Sa'ad's idea and Sa'ad engineered it and when the Prophet ﷺ came outside and he saw these women, he was happy that people are remembering Hamza and then Allah revealed the commandment that there shall be no more wailing. So it is true to say, the last person who was legitimately wailed over was Hamza. Okay, it's true to say the last person that it was halal to wail over was Hamza. After Hamza radiallahu an, khalas, you are not allowed to wail over uh, anybody. And the next battle that takes place, Sa'ad has his most famous role and his final role. Remember, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, remember this is the Mu'adh one, uh, and is his final role. And it is the most amazing role that he was to play, and that is in the Battle of the Trench. The Battle of the Trench, Khandaq, Ahzab. In the Battle of the Trench, uh, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh uh, so remember what happened in the battle of the trench that as the Sahaba are camped spread thin outside of Medina the women and children are inside a fortress on top of a mountain and the Banu Quraida are inside the trench in their area and so the Quraysh are outside and the Confederates are outside 10,000 strong and inside the city around 800 of the Banu Quraida have a treaty with the Muslims that we're going to defend against any external attack, right? Rumors began to spread that the Banu Quraida and the Quraysh have achieved a secret treaty, alliance. And on a particular day, the Banu Quraida will break the covenant that they have with the Prophet ﷺ and attack from inside, even as the Quraysh attack from outside. And that would have been the end. That would have been the end. So the Prophet ﷺ heard these news, this news, and he called both of the Sa'ads, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad and Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, whom we're going to talk about in 20 minutes, in short, 10, 15 minutes, inshallah. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad and Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. Why? Because Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad with the meme was the leader of the, guys, which one? Aus. And the Sa'ad ibn Ubadah was the leader of the Khazraj. Okay, so these two were the senior most people in the Aus and the Khazraj. He calls the both of them and he says, go and verify. And also because 
the Aus, uh, the Aus tribe had alliances with the Banu Quraidah from the days of Jahiliyyah. And the Khazraj tribe had alliances with the Banu Nadir and the Banu Qaynuqa, and they had both been expelled. Okay, so the other tribes, as you remember, the, so the last Yahudi tribe left was the Banu, the Banu Quraida. This was the last Yahudi tribe left. The other two have been expelled. And before that, in the days of Jahiliyyah, the Aus and the Banu Quraida were the ones that were allies. And they had treaties, and they had selling, and they were considered one group. And the Khazraj and the others were considered another group. And the wars that took place were between Aus and the Banu Qareeba on one side, and the Khazraj and the Banu Qaynuqa on the other side, right? So, the Aus and the Banu Qareeba are tight. They have very strong connections. And Sa'ad had personal friendships with the leaders of the Banu Qareeba. So the Prophet sent him, along with Sa'ad ibn Ubada, and they asked permission to speak untruths at this point in time, to verify. Uh, and uh, in, in war, of course, in these types of scenarios, uh, it is permissible to do that. And so the both of them went and they were allowed admittance inside of the fortress of the Banu Qurayla. And they began conversing about things of old. And you know, the memory is now coming back and the camaraderie and all of the stuff they did in the Jahili days. And then one of them, of these two remarks, you know, oh, how I wish Islam had never come. How I wish this man had never come amongst us. You know, this is now a time of war. They need to fit, verify, are these an enemy or not? The Banu Qurayla. So the Banu Qurayla let down their guard. And they as well began saying things about Astaghfirullah, Islam and the Prophet ﷺ and began hinting that things are going to happen. Okay? So they find out, the two of them, they discover that the Banu Qurayla has in fact, in actuality, broken the covenant. So they go back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they tell him what has happened. And Allah describes this moment in the Quran in Surah Al-Ahzab uh, that وَبَلَغَتْ الْقُلُوبُ الْحَنَاجِرَةِ What is the beginning of the ayah? وَإِذْ ابْتُلِيَمْ هُنَالِكَ No, before this. Before this. وَبَلَغَتْ الْحَنَاجِرَةِ وَدُونَ دُونَ Before this. What's the beginning of the ayah? Anyway, the, the point is that Allah Azza wa Jal describes the Believers as being genuinely terrified. And your, your, your hearts reached your throats. Your qulub reached your hanaj like you were so terrified. You began thinking things even about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is where the believers were tested. The point is that Allah Azza wa describes they were very, very scared. They're human beings in the end of the day. And to find out that the Quraysh are outside and the Banu Qaril are inside, and as it is, the siege has dragged on, as you know, for one month, right? Some say 40 days, most likely 20, 30 days. It would drag on water and food are, are coming to a, a, an end so clearly this was a very very uh, difficult time and uh, they found out that the Banu Quraida had in fact broken their oath and this is when Sa'ad made a special dua to Allah as we're going to come to before, before we get to that dua one more incident uh, that was the cause of Sa'ad's death and that is that one day uh, well Sa'ad Ibn Mu'adh uh, visited his mother in that fortress, you know, in the, we had talked about that fortress, and as he left, Aisha radiallahu anha looked at Sa'ad, and he was dressed in an armor that only covered the chest area. You know, there's armors that only cover the chest, and there's armors that cover the whole hands. So Aisha radiallahu anha said to the mother of Sa'ad, how I wish your son would wear the full armor, because I'm worried that he might get hurt somewhere. And that fear became materialized. That fear became materialized that during one of the minor skirmishes between the, 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 the Ahzab and the Muslims, uh, one of the uh, people by the name of Ibn Ariqa, Ibn Ariqa, he threw a javelin or a spear and he cut the major artery of the hand or the uh, the, um, the 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 um, what are you going to call this area? The arm, the upper arm, like the major artery. I don't know the names of the arteries, but whatever it is, the artery that could not, they couldn't heal it. They couldn't, you know, um, stitch it up. So he threw the javelin straight into that, and the blood just began to spurt out. And Ibn Ariqa uh, 
cried out in joy and he said take this from me and I am the son of Ariqa Ibn Ariqa and Ariqa uh, in Arabic means to sweat and so uh, uh, Sa'ad said that may Allah Azza wa Jal cause you to sweat in Jahannam Right. May Allah Azza wa Jal Ariqa Bik, may Allah Azza wa Jal cause you to sweat in uh, Jahannam. And Sa'ad was taken away uh, and they attempted to cure the wound. Sa'ad made a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he says, Oh Allah, if there shall be another war between us and the Quraysh, then allow me to live. If there's going to be another major battle, I want to live. Because there's nothing more dear to me than to oppose and to fight those people who have harmed the Messenger of Allah. But if this is the final battle, and there won't be any other major battle, then I ask you to cause me to die a shaheed. So he made this dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that if there's going to be another major battle, I want to live. And if there's going to be no more major battle, this is the end, the final one, then cause me to die as a shaheed. Then he added one more phrase. He goes, but O oh Allah, let me see what's going to happen to the Banu Qurayla first before I die. And let me be happy at what will happen to them. So Sa'ad was very hurt at the betrayal of his friends because they were his friends of the Banu Qurayla. So he makes a really bizarre dua and he goes, allow me to die a shaheed, but give me some time before I die. And subhanAllah, that wound of his remained uncurable or incurable and it worsened, worsened, worsened but he didn't die for an entire month until the Banu Qurayla issue was resolved and then he died we're going to get to that issue but subhanAllah this dua he made exactly what he made uh, Allah Azza wa Jal gave him okay so uh, the so the the, the, uh, the wound of, of Sa'ad was obviously very severe and he was taken uh, back to the camp uh, as you know, Allah Azza wa Jal got rid of the Ahzab from the miracle, as you remember, Allah mentions in the Quran, He mentioned, uh, uh, He sent an army you could not see. And so Allah took care of the Ahzab without the Muslims having to unsheathe the sword to fight them directly. Allah's army took care of the largest army ever gathered in the history of, of Arabia up until that point in time. And when uh, the battle finished, so the Prophet ﷺ ordered that Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh be given a special, not a hospital, but a special care center in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, so that he could visit him on a daily basis and monitor his upkeep on a daily basis. So Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh then lived in the Prophet ﷺ masjid, you know, for the last few weeks of the, uh, the Battle of Ahzab until it is over. And then when it became over, uh, the Prophet ﷺ then returned back. And as you all know the famous story, that he literally got home and he was about to take his armor off. And what happened? Jibreel himself came down. And Jibreel said, if you want to take your armor off, you should know the angels have not taken their armor off until you deal with the Banu Qurayla. We are not going to take our armor off until we deal with the Banu Qurayla. And our Prophet made that famous command, it was Salat al-Dhuhr, and he came out again in his armor, they came back after Fajr from the battle, uh, so he didn't take his armor off, he prayed Salat al-Dhuhr wearing his armor, and then he turned around and he said, لا يصلين أحدكم العصر إلا في بني قريضة. None of you should pray Asr except in the Banu Qurayla. And the Banu Qurayla was an hour and a half away. Now, that's, we talked about that when we talked about it. Uh, the Sahaba took a while to get ready, wear their armor again. And then on the way there, Maghrib was about to come and they hadn't prayed Asr. So they got delayed basically. And then the issue, some of them prayed Asr, some of them didn't pray it until they, they came there. And the point is that eventually on the same day, they make their way to the Banu Qurayla. They surround the Banu Qurayla. And after a few days, the Banu Qurayla agrees to a conditional surrender. Okay, because the Banu Qurayla had their fortresses and they know they're not going to be able to last out too long. So after a while, they agree to a surrender and they beg for a just judge. Meaning, astaghfirullah, la hawla they did not want the Prophet to judge them. La hawla billah. They did not want the Prophet to judge them. So they said, we'll find us another just judge. And so the Prophet said, will you be happy with your ally, your Khalif, the one that was in charge of you, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh? Are you content to make Sa'ad your judge? Now there was nobody in Medina that would have been more beloved to them than Sa'ad. The one person they could have hoped for is the one they had the strongest relationship with in the days of Jahiliyyah, and that is Sa'ad. 
And so they jumped for joy. They say, yes, of course, Sa'ad. And they felt ease that, okay, Sa'ad, he would never do anything to us. And again, you all understand what is going on here. These guys in the worst of times betrayed their trust. In the most sensitive of times, when the Muslims are perhaps the most terrified of what's going on, at that point in time, the Banu Quraidah agreed to cooperate with the uh, Quraysh and to massacre the Muslims uh, at the weakest point. After having pretended to be their allies for five years, now at the very uh, inopportune time, they become traitors and renegades and they agree that they're going to kill the Muslims. And they even talked about who's going to get which house and you know all of this. They talk who's going to get which land. They had already distributed all of this in their, in their minds and whatnot. And so... Uh, they realized that the punishment is going to be severe. But they said, okay, if it's going to be Sa'ad, at least he'll do something on our behalf. So they became happy. They said, yes, we have no problem with Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. Excellent choice. And we agree to surrender if Sa'ad is going to be the one who judges us. So the Prophet ﷺ sent for Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. And Sa'ad was literally on his last deathbed. Now, they didn't know this, but I mean, he's weak. He had to be carried uh, on a stretcher, uh, placed on an animal, on a donkey, and, you know, helped to walk all the way there because he's very, very sick and the blood has weakened him and whatnot. And on the way there, so the Prophet is in the Banu Quraida and Sa'ad is coming on the donkey. Uh, so the friends of the Banu Quraida, i.e. the hypocrites, the munafiqun, okay? Uh, the munafiqun, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, and all of them, they are walking with Sa'ad, trying to persuade him trying to convince him. Remember those days, remember they used to do this with us, I mean, just be gentle and soft, and you know, I mean, you don't have to be harsh now, and it's a mistake, they did it, and, and whatnot. And eventually, Sa'ad became irritated and frustrated, and he said, الوقت, now is the time, he's about to die, now is the time that Sa'ad does not care about the criticism of the critic. And he cares only about Allah and his messenger. Meaning, if there's any a time that I couldn't care less about humanity right now, it's going to be now. Now is the time I couldn't care about what anybody is going to say. I have to do the deed that I believe is befitting or that Allah Azza wa Jal wants to do. And so uh, he, he came on uh, the, 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 the donkey. And uh, Ibn Sa'ad says that Sa'ad was a broad-shouldered, uh, strong-looking, handsome man. And he came bandaged and whatnot. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he saw Sa'ad, he said to the Ansar, Qumu li Sayyidikum. That's hadith is in Bukhari, famous hadith. Qumu li Sayyidikum. Stand up to greet your leader. Means show some respect. He's come all this way and he is your leader. So he called Sa'ad the Sayyid of the Ansar. Qumu li Sayyidikum. So they stood up to greet Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ said to Sa'ad that the Banu Quraida have agreed to take you as the Hakam, as the judge, to decide their fate uh, about what should happen to them. Uh, and he said, Allah Azza wa Jal has chosen you, meaning Allah is happy with you as a judge. Allah Azza wa Jal has made you a judge over the very group that was your mawla, that you had a, a covenant with. This is going to be your judgment. So, Sa'ad looked to the leaders of the Banu Quraida, and he said to them, do you swear by Allah that you accept me as a judge and that you shall agree to my verdict and accept it, whatever it is? So the leader said, yes, we swear by Allah. We are happy for you as a judge. And that's one side of the plaintiff. The other side is who? The Prophet ﷺ. So he looks in that direction, but he doesn't look at the Prophet ﷺ. And he says, and this side as well, without mentioning because it is not befitting that Sa'ad asks the Prophet ﷺ directly. So he's saying, and this side, الطرف الآخر, the other side as well agrees. And subhanAllah, look at the adab. And he must already have been weak or whatnot. But he looks down, he doesn't look at the Prophet and says, is the other side as well in agreement? And the Prophet ﷺ said, yes, we are in agreement at your verdict. So Sa'ad immediately gave his verdict that all of you know. He said, the adult males should be executed for betrayal, for uh, treason and treachery, and the women and children and property will be divided as uh, ghanima, as booty. So it was essentially the strictest verdict imaginable, really. 
They couldn't have been more strict than this. And Sa'ad came to it uh, basically without any coercion from any side. It was his verdict. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, Wallahi, you have given the qada and the decree of Allah that Allah had decreed from above the seven heavens. This is the qada of Allah. This is the qada of Allah. And Allah Azza wa has basically allowed you to uh, speak it. And uh, he then returned to his tent and the wound continued to worsen until he passed away a day or two after this. So literally as his dua was that, oh Allah, if this is the final battle and it was the final battle because there's no major battle after this. The conquest of Mecca was not a battle. It was a conquest. The process of marched in and there were some mini skirmishes. There was no battle. This was the final battle, the battle of Ahzab and the uh, between the Quraysh and the Prophet and Sa'ad had made that dua that, oh Allah, if this be the final battle, then let me die a shaheed now, but l- allow me to live until I see the Banu Quraydah. And Allah allowed him to live until he saw the Banu Quraydah and what happened to them. And then he uh, passed away in the middle of the night. Ibn Sa'ad mentioned in his sabaqat that Jibreel came to the Prophet ﷺ, woke him up in the middle of the night and he said, Ya Muhammad, who is this Sahabi of yours that has passed away right now? For the doors of the heavens have opened up and the throne of Allah has shaken because of him. And of course, Jibreel knows, but it's a rhetorical question. It's not like, who is it? It's like he's trying to explain the status or the manzila of uh, Sa'ad. And the hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim, muttafaq alayhi hadith, that the Prophet sallallahu said, Ihtazza arsh rahman the, the arsh of Allah has trembled, has shaken because of the moth of, uh, because of the death of Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. So the throne of Allah has trembled. Now our scholars say, either it has trembled at the crime of killing him, or it has trembled at the excitement of meeting him. Both are allowed in this, right? That either, the, and in, in any case, it is an honor for Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, and we do not know of any other Sahabi where this phrase has been used. The throne of Allah, ihtaz al arsh. The throne of Allah has shaken at the death of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. And at the funeral, some of the munafiqun were carrying his, his, his body. And as we said, he was a huge man. He was a strong, physically fit man. And one of them began to uh, basically make disparaging remarks like, oh, this, this funeral, is this pyre, this procession is so weak. You know, what happened to that strong man? Like made a disparaging remark. And the Prophet Sallallahu said that it is light because the angels are holding it, not because you. You're not even holding it. The angels are carrying it and you are therefore feeling it to be so uh, light. And when the body of Sa'ad was placed in the Qabr, and this is one of those scary hadith that all of us should yani, ask Allah for refuge for, and it's also in Sahih Bukhari and other books, of famous books of hadith, that the Prophet ﷺ said, Subhanallah, when his body was lowered down and the, the sand was put on, he said, Subhanallah. So they said, why are you saying Subhanallah? He said, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh has experienced the Dhammatul Qabr. And the Dhammatul Qabr is the constriction of the Qabr. Okay, so pause here, footnote. Uh, We learn from our traditions that as soon as the body is placed in the Qabr, uh, even before the Fitnatul Qabr, the Fitna is Munkar and Nakir. Okay, the fitna is Munkar and Nakir coming. And Munkar and Nakir coming is called the fitna to Qabr. And the fitna to Qabr is the testing, okay, the examination. And then after the fitna, you either have Naim al Qabr or Adab al Qabr. We ask Allah to be amongst the Naim al Qabr. We seek Allah's refuge from being the Adab. But before the fitna, there's something called Dhamma to Al Qabr. Dhamma means the squeezing, the squeezing. And our Prophet says, Subhanallah, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad has just finished the Dhamma, the squeezing. And if anybody were to have been made exempt from the squeezing, it would have been Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. Any person would be saved from the Dhamma, it would be Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. But even Sa'ad had to go through the squeezing. As for the fitna, the shaheed doesn't have it. So the fitna, the shaheed is bypassed. There is no fitna for the shaheed. Okay, so the shaheed automatically jumps to not even the Naim al Qabr, the shaheed goes straight up there. The shaheed doesn't even have Naim al-Qabr. Because the ruh of the shaheed, what happens? We all know this. What happens? Becomes into uh, the body of a blessed bird and the bird is in Jannah flying around. So uh, he doesn't even have Naim al-Qabr. It goes straight up to Jannah. Now, 
the point here is that the Prophet ﷺ is saying that this dhamma or this squeezing took place to Sa'ad and Sa'ad was the only person who would have been able to pass it if anybody had passed it, but even he did not pass it. And Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad passed away. He died a shaheed in the fifth year of the Hijrah, the year of the Khandaq, right? And obviously because of this, there are no hadith narrated by him because obviously he died middle Medina. So what hadith is going to be narrated by him? That is, you know, it's not, there is no hadith narrated by Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, uh, but he is mentioned by the Prophet ﷺ in one more hadith afterwards, most likely in the seventh or the eighth year of the Hijrah, so three years after his death. There's a beautiful hadith that is mentioned in Sunan al-Tirmidhi and other books of hadith, in which uh, the, uh, the, in which, uh, the Prophet ﷺ was sent a very exotic and beautiful robe. And in fact, in the hadith it says, it even had gold trimmings on it. And this created a huge controversy amongst the fuqaha. Can men wear robes with gold trimmings and decorations? A huge controversy. And the Hanafis had a position, Ibn Taymiyyah had a position, others had a position besides the, the point of this class now. But it was a very beautiful robe, so beautiful that when the Prophet stood up to give the khutbah, the Sahaba began feeling it and looking at it, like they were distracted because of the, 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 uh, the robe. It was luxurious garment and and this shows us that the process did not mind wearing something fancy but he never brought it by the way that's the process ate the best of food if he got it he wore the best of clothes if he got it but unlike us he didn't go out of his way to get it okay not that it's haram but that's the perfection we go out of our way and we have good food and we have good clothing our process did not go out of his way but when it came to him he enjoyed it and in this case, he wore this robe that the Sahaba began to feel it in the khutbah. Can you imagine how beautiful it must have been? It's distracting them so much. And they said, Wallahi ma ra'ayna mithla hadha qat. We never have seen anything as luscious or beautiful as this. And our Prophet ﷺ said, Ata'jabuna min hadha? You are impressed with this? Fa wallahi lamandilu Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh fil jannah afdalu min hadha. The handkerchief of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh in Jannah is better than this entire garment. And the handkerchief is a dirty cloth, you know, you use it for your dirt and whatnot. So he's saying the least item that's, and he mentions now the name of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. The least item that Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh has in Jannah is much better than this uh, garment that I have. So this is the famous Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. All of you should remember the leader of the Aus, the one who judged with the Banu Quraida and the one who passed away in the battle of the Khandaq. The one who people confuse him with is our next character, our next person of the Sahaba, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. Okay, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah was the leader of the Khazraj. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad is leader of the Aus, and that's why people get confused. Sa'ad ibn Ubadah was the leader of the Khazraj, and he too embraced Islam at the same time as Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, which is in between the first and the second treaty of Aqaba. And he too attends the second treaty of Aqaba. And uh, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah has a few specialities. He is the only one of the Ansar who was tortured by the people of Mecca. No other Ansari was tortured by the people of Mecca. So Sa'ad ibn Ubadah was the only Ansari who was captured and tortured by the people of Mecca. And the story, I mentioned it many, many years ago when we did the seerah, and that is that uh, when the second treaty of Aqaba took place, a few days later, the Quraysh heard about it. Maybe the second day they heard about it, that it had taken place, and they became incensed, enraged. How dare any people from Yathrib make a treaty with the Banu Hashim, with the Prophet ﷺ, and agree to take him away. It's a matter of honor for them. So they marched out to Mina to see who amongst the people of Yathrib are left. And they found only a few. They found Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. And they knew Abdullah ibn Ubay. And he swore by Allah, I have no idea what's going on. I don't know anything about this. And he said his ridiculous statement, I can assure you, my people of Yathrib would never have done this without asking me, because I am their leader. Even though they had already done it, and you know they didn't care about him. So they let him go, they trusted him. Then they found Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. And they kind of figured out, we don't know the exact details, maybe they asked him what not. They kind of figured out he was one of those who took the, the treaty. Right? So they captured him and tied him up and beat him and dragged him and they took him to Mecca and they began punching and beating him. So that's why he's the only Ansari who was 
um, uh, 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 persecuted by the people of Mecca. Because obviously, how are the people of Medina going to be persecuted? And they kept him there, and uh, they tortured him uh, in their own way until finally somebody had sympathy and said to him, don't you have any friends in Mecca that can help you? So he mentioned, yes, I had a few business dealings with Fulan and Fulan. So he mentioned some names. So the guy went to his previous business partners and uh, they came and he would have, must have negotiated whatever. And so they managed to free him and send him back to uh, Medina. And so uh, Sa'ad ibn, ibn Ubadah therefore becomes the only Ansari who is uh, tortured by the uh, Quraysh. And Sa'ad ibn Ubadah being the leader of the Khazraj was extremely wealthy. And he would make dua to Allah to give him more wealth so that he could be generous. And so Sa'ad ibn Ubadah was one of the most generous of the Khazraj. In fact, he had a daily uh, buffet. Every day he would have an area of his house that was meant for the poor people to eat from. And whenever possible, he would give them meat and fat because fat was something, a delicacy. They liked to eat meat and fat. And he was known for uh, being very generous. And uh, people would come to his house at any time to be fed. And uh, a number of Sahaba said that whenever somebody has some extra food, they would take one or two people from the Ahl al-Suffa. And Sa'ad ibn Ubadah would take 80 people from the people of Suffa. He would feed 80 people from the people of Sufa when he had food. And that's why our Prophet made a very special dua, which is very rare to find. It's there and it's halal and it's allowed. Most Muslims don't realize this. To send your salah upon other than the Prophet Okay, It is permitted. It is permissible. Okay, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Yes, of course. But to say Allahumma salli ala somebody else, it is allowed. It's permissible. And our Prophet made it very rarely. One of the people he did it for is Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. And he did it because of the generosity of Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. And of course, his wife and his family would cook the food. And so our Prophet said that, O oh Allah, send your salawat and your rahamat upon the al, the family of Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. Because obviously him and his wife are you know, together. I mean, he's doing the, the, the sacrificing, she's doing the cooking, whatever. So he, the Prophet made the salat and salam to the family of Sa'ad ibn Ubadah because of his generosity. And so this dua is being made and therefore Allah Azza wa Jal blessed Sa'ad with even more wealth and his generosity was well known. In the conquest of Mecca, uh, the Prophet gave the banner of the Ansar to Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad is dead. Mecca, he's dead. So who's going to hold the banner of the Ansar? Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. And so this shows us that Sa'ad ibn Ubadah has now become the de facto leader of the Ansar. However, it was taken away right before they entered Mecca. What happened? Sa'ad ibn Ubadah started versifying some poetry. And he talked about finally wreaking vengeance on the Quraysh. And Umar heard this. And Umar said, Ya Rasulullah, if the Quraysh hear him, he's going to die. If the Quraysh hear that one of non Qurayshi is saying this, they won't care about anything, he's going to be killed. So the Prophet agreed, and so to protect Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, he sent Ali instead, and so the, the banner was then given over to Ali as a protection for Sa'ad, now that he's versified that we're going to wreak vengeance on the Quraysh. So he got a little bit overexcited, and the Quraysh or the Umar felt that it's going to be very dangerous if the Quraysh find out that he said this or they're going to get their vengeance on him. So he was replaced at the last minute with Ali ibn Abi Talib. Uh, after the battle of uh, the conquest of Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ went obviously on Tabuk and Hunayn. And in the incident of Hunayn, the Prophet ﷺ distributed, as you know, wealth left and right to the Bedouins and to the people of Najd. And Sa'ad ibn Ubadah asked permission to come into the tent of the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, some of the Ansar are feeling that you have given strangers and uh, Bedouins and the people up north and you have given and given and given and the people who have fought with you and the people who have helped you and the people who have done this they have gotten nothing from you meaning us okay you haven't given anything to us and the Prophet said and what is your opinion O Sa'ad how do you feel and Sa'ad said Ana rajulun min qawmi. I am one of my people meaning there's something that we are all feeling we cannot help it. And subhanAllah, yani it's very difficult. Wallahi, the lure of wealth is something that, and this is a halal 
يعني, uh, you know, intention that they have that they want to have halal rizq. So the Prophet said to Sa'ad, call all of the Ansar in a tent and make sure there's nobody but the Ansar there. So again, he's put in charge of this task. So Sa'ad ibn Ubadah comes and he g- gathers the Ansar and the Prophet then gives a very, very emotional lecture um, it's in the books. I did it when I did the Battle of Hunayn, and uh, he said that uh, if the uh, if the Ansar took any road and all of mankind took another road, I would go with the road of the Ansar, and I am a person of the Ansar, and the Ansar are from me, and I am from the Ansar, and may Allah bless the Ansar and the children of the Ansar and the children of the children of the Ansar, and he said that the rest of the people are leaving with camels and gold and silver. Are you not happy to leave with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? And they. All of them cried and the tent was weeping until every one of them said, Radina billahi rabban wa bil islami deenan wa bi muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam nabiyyan wa rasula. So they were happy and content and the Prophet solved this um, issue. And uh, the next time Sa'ad is mentioned is the uh, very awkward incident which needs to be known and said, and that is the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That uh, when the Prophet passed away, uh, the Ansar gathered together in the Saqifah of Bani Sa'idah. And the Saqifah was a place where the Ansar had a large gathering. And Sa'ad ibn Ubadah was their leader at the time. And talk began to put Sa'ad in charge of the entire community. Okay, Khalifa. To put Sa'ad in charge because he is the leader of the Ansar and this is Medina and the Ansar are the people of Medina. And so the perception was that Sa'ad would be the next, or not the next, the first Khalifa. And somebody came running to Abu Bakr and said, you had better go, better go to Bani, the, the Saqifa right now because the Ansar have gathered under Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. And... Uh, Abu Bakr and Umar and Abu Ubaidah Amr ibn Jarrah, the three of them, they walked to the Saqifah of Bani Sa'idah. And what happened, happened as you all know that uh, some back and forth took place. And Abu Bakr and Umar wanted to speak up. And Umar said, and I had my anger rushing up. And Abu Bakr said to me, stay quiet, Umar. I'll do the talking. And he goes, just out of respect of Abu Bakr, I stayed quiet. And lo and behold, everything that was in my mind, Abu Bakr said it and better than me. Abu Bakr said it and better than me. No anger, what not. And Abu Bakr praised the Ansar and he said that the Prophet chose you and you are this and that. But in the end of the day, the Prophet is from amongst us and no one will accept the leadership of the Ansar amongst the Arabs, but they will accept the leadership of the Quraysh. And so uh, he said uh, that you are the wuzara, but we are the umara. You are the helpers, the wazir, you are the prime ministers, you are the, the helpers, but the leaders have to be from the Quraysh. And uh, this obviously caused some tension. One of them said, let's have two leaders, one from us and one from you. Meaning Sa'ad ibn Ubadah will be one of our leaders and you can choose one of your leaders. And no community can have two leaders, okay? And their voices began to be raised and that was when uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab basically uh, said that khalas, let us give the bay'at to Abu Bakr. Of course, Abu Bakr had before that raised both of their hands and they said, no, we want to have one leader, one leader. So Umar then said, no, Abu Bakr is our leader. Let's give bay'at to him. And so they all gave their bay'at to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq except for Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. Sa'ad ibn Ubadah in all likelihood did not give the bay'ah. And there's an awkward phrase, which again, I'd rather you hear from me than from other people. These are things that maybe for beginning classes, we don't mention them, but in these classes, uh, it's best that you hear it from me and we explain it. So the hadith is actually in Bukhari and it's in every book of hadith or every book of seerah that when they walked out, one of the Ansar said to Umar ibn Khattab, قَدْ قَتَلْتُمْ سَعَدْ ibn Ubada. You have killed our leader Sa'ad ibn Ubada. And the qatala here doesn't mean you have physically killed him. It means you've destroyed his career. That's what it would mean. Okay? Like you have gotten rid of him. And Umar responded, rather it was Allah who killed Sa'ad ibn Ubada. 
And again, qatala does not here mean kill. Now, this is a very awkward phrasing. What does it mean? It was Allah who killed Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. Uh, the commentators of hadith have tried their best to find a meaning that is something they like. And a number of them have said different things. One meaning is, it is as it appears to be, and that is the anger of Umar, and he's making dua against Sa'ad. That's one opinion. That he is irritated at Sa'ad ibn Ubadah for wanting to be the Amir when he understands that it's not logical or rational for an Ansari to be the leader of the entire Arabian Peninsula, especially given that we have Abu Bakr and others who have been with the Prophet from the beginning. So Umar is maybe justifiably very irritated, and in his irritation he says a very harsh thing when somebody says to him, you killed Umar, he responds rather, it said, bad dua, like bad dua, may Allah Azza wa Jal get rid of Sa'ad. This is one interpretation. Another interpretation is that this is a statement of fact that don't ascribe Sa'ad's death to me. Allah will cause him to die when Allah calls, causes him to die. So that's an easier way of trying to you know, make it softer. And it's a nice attempt, but in reality, it does seem to be the first meaning. And, that's, and this is, again, in a state of anger, you say things. And also, given the circumstance and given the tension that would have been there and whatnot, we can understand Umar's justifiable irritation and a little bit of a harsh wording comes out. And it does appear that Sa'ad ibn Ubadah uh, was very hurt at what had happened, and uh, Abu Bakr did not know what to do with Sa'ad's refusal to not give the bay'ah. And one of the advisors to Abu Bakr said, if you're going to harm or do something to Sa'ad, then you're going to have to harm his family. If you harm his family, you're going to have to harm the, uh, the, the Khazraj. If you're going to harm the Khazraj, then they also will get involved. And why would you do that? Just let him be, ignore him, and he's just one man. So that was the policy of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, and Sa'ad ibn Ubadah does not appear to have participated in anything. None of the battles, none of the conquests, he just lived literally a, just a withdrawn life after this. Then Umar becomes the Khalifa, and Umar is of a stricter nature, and he demands that you know you're going to have to give the oath. And Saad uh, does not wish to do that, and so Umar says, in that case, leave us, go find another city to live in. And so Saad then leaves for another city, and here is where one of the most bizarre twists in early books of history takes place. One of the most bizarre incidents in the lives of the Sahaba. And Allah knows if it's true or not. Sa'ad ibn Ubadah is called Qatilul Jinn. The one whom the jinn killed. Okay, This is the title of Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. And pretty much all the books of history mention this. That he is the Qatilul Jinn. He is the one whom the jinn killed. And Allah knows best if it's true or not. But it is mentioned in pretty much all the books of early history, Ibn Abdul Barr and others, they mention this, Ibn Sa'ad and others, they mention this, that in the 14th year of the Hijrah, in the second year of Umar's Khilafah, uh, Sa'ad uh, Ibn Ubadah died mysteriously. And uh, Ibn Abdul Barr mentions the famous early um, scholar uh, from Andalus, and he wrote a, a large compilation of the Sahaba, one of the first books written about the, the, the biographies of the Sahaba is by Ibn Abdul Barr, uh, Al-Isti'a fi Ma'rifat al-Ashab. And he writes in it that they found Sa'ad dead at the place where he would regularly bathe, and they only knew that he had died in that bathing place when they heard a voice from the wilderness cry out, قَدْ قَتَلْنَا سَيِّدَ الْخَزْرَجْ سَعَدْ إِبْنْ عُبَادَةِ وَرَمَيْنَاهُ بِسَحْمَيْنِ فَلَمْ يُخْطِئْ فُؤَادَةِ uh, the voice is crying out, we have killed the leader of the Khazraj, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, and we threw a spear or two spears into him, and we did not miss his heart. Okay, now there wasn't an actual spear, but he was found dead. And Muhammad ibn Sirin, who is the famous Tabi'i, uh, but he didn't meet Sa'ad, but you know, he's a Tabi'i, he's a student of Abu Huraira, he's a student of many of the great Sahaba. Muhammad ibn Sirin said that uh, it is said that Sa'ad was urinating while standing and he fell over and died, the jinn having killed him at that time. And it is said, Ibn Sa'ad mentions that when they found Sa'ad, his skin had turned a greenish hue. Okay, so he had a strange death. 
Now, Shaykh Al-Albani, he mentions, the chains of the story are not authentic, even though the story is narrated and mashhur in the books of history. Okay? So the story is well known and is found in many books of early history, but technically speaking, there's no chain that is connected. Ibn Sirin uh, did say this, but Ibn Sirin did not meet Sa'ad directly. Nonetheless, Ibn Sirin is a student of the Sahaba. So there is a slight broken chain, but nonetheless, there seems to be something. It's a very strange death, inexplicable death. And it is possible for the jinn to harm the people. It is possible for the jinn to kill the people if they get irritated for some reason. And so Allah Azza wa knows best the truth. Nonetheless, he died in, in mysterious circumstances. Now, uh, the bizarre twist here as well, which is totally untrue. Uh, the non-Sunni sect, okay? They claim that Umar ibn Khattab assassinated Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. And this is a part and parcel of their fake legends about Abu Bakr and Umar. Because you know they don't like these two. Radiallahu anhum. They don't like them. And so they have a whole long list of evil things that they have done. Okay? And they make Sa'ad into a hero. From, his, from their perspective, Sa'ad didn't want to give the bay'ah to those Abu Bakr and Umar. And he was waiting for Ali to come. They made it, they make this twist. Which is completely... I mean, really, there's no evidence for this whatsoever. And so once that is the case, now they then read in that Astaghfirullah, Umar ibn Khattab, radiallahu an, from their perspective. And I'm only telling you this so that you are aware of the lie. It is a complete, vicious lie. It has not a shred of evidence to it. But like much of their version of history, they have their theological biases that they then concoct a narrative of history that fits their agenda. Now, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, he died in the 14th year of the Hijrah, so therefore he does have a few hadith, we'll just do two or three of them, because he did live a few years after the death of the Prophet So, uh, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, he has uh, 56, 60, he has literally nine hadith, no, uh, Seven hadith, seven hadith. Just a small, well, just do three or four of them so that you get an idea. He indeed is, he did narrate hadith. Um, of the hadith that he has in the Muslim Imam Ahmad, uh, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that no leader will come on the day of judgment except that his hands will be tied up and it is only his justice that will open his hands up. And no one who will be taught the Quran uh, and then having been forgotten it, uh, except that he will meet Allah, uh, amputated or not full. Okay, so if you forgot the Quran that you memorized, this is a sin. Now, some of the scholars say the hadith is slightly weak. Some say it is Hassan li ghayrihi. Uh, another hadith which is authentic, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah narrated, that uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked, what are the blessings of Jumu'ah? So he said, there are five blessings. Number one, Adam was created. Number two, on Jum'ah. Number two, Adam came down to this earth. Number three, Adam died on that day. Number four, there's not a single time, sorry, there's not a single person, uh, except that if he asks Allah one hour of that day, anything, as long as it is something that is permissible and doesn't break the ties of kinship, except that Allah will give it to him. And number five, on Jumu'ah, the day of judgment will take place and there's not a single angel in the heavens or earth except that he is scared of Jumu'ah because it might be the day of um, judgment. So this is an authentic hadith about the blessings of Jumu'ah. Another hadith by Sa'ad ibn Ubadah that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed by him. He said, Ya Rasulullah, tell me the best charity. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Isqil ma, give water to those who don't have water. And a similar hadith, which is a beautiful hadith, and pay attention to this. It comes in handy for all of us who are trying to help out other people. Sa'ad ibn Ubadah said, my mother passed away. So I said, Ya Rasulullah, my mother has passed away. Should I give charity on her behalf? He said, yes. So I asked, what charity is best? He said, Siqayatul ma or Siqyul ma, which is to build a, um, to dig a well and to, you know, give the well, the water to the poor. So Sa'ad built many wells for the people of Medina, and they were still called the wells of the family of um, Sa'ad. Uh, and there are some other uh, 
a hadith as well uh, that um, are mentioned the, of them is loving the Ansar as a part of Iman and hating the Ansar as a part of hypocrisy. There's a famous hadith like that, also mentioned by Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. The point being, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah has just a few hadith, that's it. And um, his death is a sad one, and especially the, the tensions that took place. And this also shows us, brothers and sisters, and I've said this many times when we talk about the Sahaba, that here we have a Sahabi whom the Prophet prayed for, and he used the word Salli. And here we have a Sahabi that throughout his life he was of the most respected and reputable Sahaba. And after the death of the Prophet minor issues took place between great Sahaba. And it shows us that it is possible for good people to have disputes between them. Because clearly Sa'ad is a great Sahabi. And the people that were on the other side were also great Sahaba. No doubt one of them was greater than the other. No doubt Abu Bakr and Umar are Muhajirun, but Sa'ad is of the leader of the Ansar. And the Prophet gave him the raya on the conquest of Mecca, which is enough of an honor. And the Prophet asked Allah to send his salah and his rahmah upon the family of Sa'ad. And so many blessings are mentioned about Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. Yet still, there was tension with regards to the politics of this world. And this is the reality of human beings, brothers and sisters. It doesn't matter how righteous and pious you are, we are humans. And there are going to be issues that take place, especially between other humans, that are not perfect. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to overlook these mistakes that happen with me and you and with everybody. And that Allah Azza wa Jal causes both of these groups to enter Jannah, which is going to happen for the Sahaba. In fact, much worse happened afterwards between Ali and Muawiyah radiallahu an. And Ali radiallahu anh himself uh, defended Muawiyah even though they were fighting each other and going to war with each other. And Ali radiallahu anh made dua to Allah and he said, Oh Allah, make me and Muawiyah amongst those whom you say, وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي صُدُورِهِ مِنْ غِلٍ إِخْوَانًا عَلَى سُرُرٍ متقابلين. Oh Allah, remove what is the hatred that we have in our hearts. Remove that hatred that we have. And uh, because Allah says in the Quran, sorry, the dua was make us amongst those people. What does the Quran say? The Quran says, we removed their hatred. We removed the ghil that was in their hearts and we made them ikhwan, brothers. In this world, they were fighting one another. In this world, they're enemies of one another. In this world, they're literally shedding blood, the both of them in war. And Ali radiallahu anh said, Oh Allah, make us amongst those people. And inshallah, it will happen because the both are Sahaba. So if this is the case with the Sahaba, that there is so much animosity and friction, then subhanAllah, how about me and you? And how about other people? We should understand this is the reality of humanity. And we should make dua anytime this happens, that we are always of the better of the two. And that our hearts are pure of such animosity and malice and hatred. And that even our worst enemies, if they say the kalima and they believe in Allah and His Messenger and they have khair, that may Allah Azza wa Jal remove the animosity and the rancor of our hearts and cause us to enter Jannah, ikhwan and ala sururin mutaqabideen. And inshallah with that we finish today's halaqa. Yes, go ahead. So the issue of memorizing the Qur'an and forgetting it, there are a hadith in Tirmidhi, in Musad Imam Ahmad and others, that whoever forgets the Qur'an, it is a sin. But all of these hadith have slight weaknesses in their chain. And so there's nothing authentic. Nonetheless, our scholars say, it is not befitting that somebody has memorized the Qur'an and then he forgets it out of laziness. It's different if you forget it because of poor memory. There are people, their memory becomes poor as they become older and that's normal and natural. But the one who forgets it because they don't do muraja'ah of it, Imam al nawi says it is a kabira. Imam al nawi says it's a major sin. But there doesn't seem to be any evidence for it's a major sin. Rather, there's no question that if Allah yani, has blessed you with the Qur'an that you should keep it up and memorize it and whatnot to the greatest extent possible but there does not seem to be an authentic hadith to this effect but there are daif hadith so keep that point in mind. As for Sa'ad ibn Ubadah's departure 
it does not appear to have caused any issue. And this also demonstrates that the leadership of Abu Bakr and Umar was now solidified. And the Ansar understood and they had agreed to this, right? So it was simply a personal issue. And again, as I had mentioned, you can have great Iman and Taqwa and in one area have an ijtihad that falls short of that level of Iman and Taqwa. So Sa'id ibn Ubadah, did, it did not affect his Iman. He was still a righteous person. His Salah, his Zakah, his Siyam is still the same. But when it comes to these issues of politics, he had a very, very strong position. And he had his ijtihad. And he acted upon that ijtihad. Okay. He went to Busra, Basra, not Basra, uh, south of Damascus, yeah, uh, Syria. Or some say he went to um, the city next to it. I forgot the name of it. But he went basically to one of these newly conquered territories and just lived literally a year over there and then passed away. Because it was literally just moved up there. Yes, go ahead. Uh, don't take me wrong, but uh, I've heard that uh, Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he used to recite the Muqtad Nazla against the Amir Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And the ayat he recited, he used to recite it for Talha and Zubair because they were against him also in Jammu. And not against, not for Muawiyah because he said that my and Muawiyah, his children will be in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because whatever he did, so this narration is found in the non-Sunni books. In the Sunni books, it is explicit that Ali radiallahu an made dua for Muawiyah that Allah azza wa jal makes him together in Jannah. He wasn't happy with Muawiyah. They didn't meet face to face since the thing started. And there are tensions and there are phrases that are very, but it is very explicit that Ali radiallahu an never said that Muawiyah is a non-Muslim. He never said that Muawiyah is an evil person. So how then, if you have read this yourself, how then could the other thing be true? It's a contradiction. So it's not found in the classical Sunni sources. Go and look up the classical Sunni sources because you have to realize Muawiyah I don't even know if we're going to do his 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 uh, his history because it's a very detailed one and it's a very sensitive one uh, and there are issues that are found even in our sources that are somewhat awkward but whatever is found we do not find any of the Sahaba accusing him of being not faithful to Islam especially the great Sahaba like Ali where they were angry with him there's no question. How could you not be when there's a war going on? You know, people are dying. You know, tens of thousands of Sahaba were killed. How could you not be angry? Each one of them is angry at the other. And yes, Muawiyah radiallahu as well is very angry at Ali. But to get to the level of excommunicating them from Jannah, this did not happen. And it is authentically narrated, this issue. And I have read this myself in Fada'il al-Sahaba, I think of um, Imam Ahmad or others. I mean, I'll have to look at it, but Imam Ahmad definitely has it in there. That uh, Ali radiallahu an is praising, not praising, but he's saying, may Allah make us amongst those people in Jannah. Inshallah, the time is late, so inshallah, we are stopped for today and see you guys next week, inshallah, for these lectures. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.